thank you everybody for um, participating in this event. Uh, so like Jody mentioned, this is an event that's uh, supported by EFI, the Ecological Forecasting Initiative and the Statistical Ecology Section from ESA, uh, the Ecological Society of America. So, so without further ado, um, let me introduce Josh. So Josh is a postdoc uh, here at University of Florida. Um, his work is focused on developing methods to infer, infer animal movement patterns and resource selection from biotelemetry data. And in addition to that, he's also assessing the impact of climate change on population viability of snail kites, which are an endangered raptor species. So Josh is interested in the development of shiny apps for both for exploratory data analysis, as well as to serve as a, a decision support tools. Um, so the topic for today's uh, webinar is gonna be uh, visualization of data in space and time, an interactive framework. Uh, I think those were uh, my main comments. And so I think the floor is yours, Josh. Great, thanks for the intro. Uh... Dennis and Jody. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and start this presentation. All right, so I'd like to start off by thanking everybody for being here today. Um, happy to talk about this topic with you. Um, so like Dennis said, I'm gonna be discussing visualization of data in space and time um, and interactive framework, especially within the context of R and Shiny. Um, so I'm assuming that everyone at least has a, a decent understanding of R and has some basic grasp of Shiny and what it is. Um, although I'll, I'll give some background on that as well. Um, and I'd like to thank, I'll start by thanking the Ecological Forecasting Initiative and the Statistical Ecology section of ESA uh, for supporting this webinar series. Okay, so in the sciences in general, as well as um, especially in ecology, spatiotemporal data are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Um, so I'm showing this figure from Barbara, Brock, Barbara Block and colleagues in 2011 of their TOPS program, tagging of Pacific predators. Um, and you can see here just a sample of all these different marine animals, megafauna that they've tagged. Um, so there's obviously this very explicit spatial component, but then underlying that, this temporal component. So these animals are moving and accessing resources through time across this huge ocean basin. Additionally, um, sea ice extent. So that inherently is spatial. You have sea ice throughout the Arctic as well as the Antarctic um, that's constantly changing over the course of a year and then over the course of many years. Um, so this is a screenshot of the most recent data that I pulled off the National Snow and Ice Data Center um, showing the Arctic sea ice extents for 2021 shown as that black line or dark purple um, compared to the overall mean across a number of years and then the record minimum um, from 2012. And we're looking here only at a time series, but also there's this spatial component that's not being um, observed here. And then lastly, another example showing um, an impact assessment, essentially, if you wanna compare um, before and after a an event such as a protection of a certain site um, and you have a control and then a treatment factor. So we have these, these two different sites, so that's our spatial components, um, but we're also interested in the intervention here, the protection of a location and seeing that how that affects trends of a population such as for this common mergancer. Um, and it, as this case study by Waco et al from this past year. Additionally, visualizing spatiotemporal patterns can also be very difficult to do. Um, so here's a movie showing hawksbill sea turtles from the Arabian Gulf um, moving around. And this is part of a study that I was involved with, um, but showing that there's one, here's one mechanism to view animal movement in space and time. Um, so you could, you could also do this with a GIF if you wanted to. And this is showing hawksbill sea turtle movements um, with respect to sea surface temperature, SST, in this basin. Additionally, you could also create what's often called facet plots. Um, so you have each of these individual subplots, um, and those represent individual dates here shown for Hurricane Harvey. And this is showing um, for the Gulf Coast of the US, 
uh, total precipitation per day. So we get the spatial components and also this temporal components um, shown all in one figure. And this is shown for 15 days. Uh, but what if you have more days, more years, more regions of interest? Um, something like this can really blow up and make it very difficult to actually visualize um, certain patterns of interest. And then lastly, another anim our example from animal movements. Um, you may also be interested in tagging animals and estimating their latent behavioral states and seeing how that might be um, associated with different land cover types. Um, so in this plot on the top left, this is showing tagged giant armadillos that were modeled um, for state estimation, so behavioral states. And this is overlaid on top of a land use land cover map. And it's just really difficult to understand what these organisms are doing, um, partially because there's just so many points that are overlapping each other. And then there's also all these individuals. Um, it just makes it really difficult to try to get at the nuts and bolts of um, any different patterns that might be exhibited, whether they're going to nests or burrows, or they're making these long excursions or migratory looping patterns. Um, so it's really hard to just do it with a lot of these um, common methods for trying to get at or visualize um, spatiotemporal data. So the kind of way I ran into this problem um, when I first started my postdoc at the University of Florida was a collaborative effort with uh, Dennis and another co-advisor of mine, Rob Fletcher. And uh, we were trying to determine the behavior and space use patterns of this endangered raptor, the snail kite that's found in Florida. Um, so I had data from 27 tagged individual snail kites, and those are all mapped and shown on the right side here for peninsular Florida. And right away, you can see that there's a lot of kind of track density right in the very middle and along this Kissimmee River corridor between Lake Okeechobee and some of these other smaller lakes in North Central Florida. Um, and then there's all these larger excursion movements and you see a lot of loops and then a lot of um, movements north and south um, along the Central Corridor but it's really difficult to see how long they're spending in some of these areas, um, where they're traveling to, what the shape of these movements look like. Um, so we tried a number of different things to kind of get at some of these patterns to figure out what was going on. Uh, first was, like I mentioned before, creating a facet plot. Um, so doing this at different spatial or temporal scales, um, but this got really big really quickly um, just because there were 27 tagged birds and this was potentially spanning a couple years so depending on what scale you're looking at this, it could be um, really difficult to, to visualize. Additionally, you could plot only um, the time series of select variables of interest, um, often in movement ecology, estimating uh, behavioral states. You might be interested in step lengths and turning angles um, or other kind of ancillary data. Um, but this completely removes the, the spatial component of what you're looking at. Um, so those patterns of space use are kind of just left out. Um, but you, you probably want to include those as well. So another uh, method we came across is trying to create a 3D plot. So you have space and time in the X and Y axes, and then your Z dimension is time. And while we could do that, it was just really difficult to visualize that. And you have to spin the space-time cube around, and especially for 27 tagged birds, um, it's like around 10,000 or more observations. Again, it was just too dense and too difficult to actually get at. Um, so that was the kind of problem we ran into and we didn't have any good tools for actually visualizing these data. So our solution was to create a Shiny app. So uh, here's a screenshot of the Shiny app that I have currently. Um, and this is part of the Bayes Move package that we've been developing um, for dealing with animal movement data. And this allows you to interactively visualize animal telemetry data over space and time. Um, and I'll talk about each of these separate components. Um, so the, the Shiny app is within this Bayes Move package as a function you can just run. All it requires is a data frame um, with your movement data and you just need a column for ID, X and Y coordinates and date. Or you can access it online uh, through the Shiny server where I have it hosted. Um, and you would just load a CSV file to visualize this. Um, but I'm going to discuss these two main components that help you visualize your data set over space and time simultaneously. So first, focusing on time. Um, so we have a sidebar panel here on the left at the top of this app, and on the right side is our plot or our figure. 
So there's two inputs. The first input is allowing you to select an ID. So you can only really visualize one ID at a time um, in the current version of this app. And then beneath that is another drop down menu for inputs where you select different variables that are part of your data set. Um, and these variables could be any number of things. Um, so for this plot shown on this image, time is on the X axis and the X coordinates of this individual's uh, track is shown on the Y axis. Um, but you could have variables that are intrinsic properties of these tracks, such as speed. So the speed between consecutive observations or things such as net square displacement. And this variable is often used to uncover um, migratory patterns. So it's the distance um, from the initial starting location to every other location, which is net displacement. And you would just square that. Additionally, you can also have remote sensing data. So you might overlay your track on top of uh, any number of variables such as NDVI in terrestrial environments or sea surface temperature in marine environments and extract these per observation. And then you can explore these more um, within this app. Or you could also have a derived variable such as distance to a feature of interest. So this feature could be distance to a road, distance to a protected area's boundary, distance to a body of water, any number of things like that as well. And then the second part is this spatial component. So having this interactive map that you can zoom or pan around in um, and get a sense of where this animal's moving to, um, what that underlying habitat might be. Um, so like I mentioned, what type of land use land cover it might be moving across or intensively using. Um, if you're looking more at human dimensions, you might want to look at how often these animals are crossing roads, especially if you're trying to mitigate um, animals being hit by cars or other vehicles. Um, if it's in an aquatic environment, are they near any bathymetric features, such as a continental slope or like a deep pool of water during the summer in a large lake or a thawweg of a large river? Also, if the animal is occupying any unusual habitats, so an animal might be seeking refugia at a power plant or it might be um, creating a nest in a suburban community complex. Um, where otherwise it might be typically found in more remote wetlands or forests or something to that effect. Um, so there's a number of ways you can kind of visualize these data to explore some of these patterns you might not have seen otherwise. So the key feature that I'm going to be focusing on today um, for this app is linking space and time together. So you can do each of these separately and that's all well and good, but um, I think that the power here, at least for this simple type of app, is being able to select a period of time that you're interested in and then look at the spatial properties of that track. Um, so that's what I'm going to be emphasizing during, um, especially the hands-on portion later during this presentation. So um, like I mentioned, this, this screenshot shown on the right, um, we see this plot is only a subset of the entire time series um, shown in that red box. And that's going to reactively update what is shown on this map. So the highlighted turquoise section of the track is what is shown here on this uh, actual plot. And then everything else outside of that time window is left here in gray. So when could this feature be useful? Um, well, there's a number of different instances, such as if you're interested in determining uh, land cover. So like I mentioned before, um, especially with, depending on your base map, if you have satellite imagery underlaying that, um, you can get really fine scale uh, spatial satellite imagery here. Um, and that might be able to help you uncover um, locations that this animal is using you didn't realize before. Because um, we, we came across that with our snail kite data exploration where they were using um, different areas or water bodies basically as part of power plants um, as sources of wetlands that they were searching for their snail prey potentially. Um, and this was especially common apparently in, in juvenile birds for this species. Additionally, you might be interested in a particular window of time, um, such as a migratory period and the uh, period when the animal is leaving and then the period that it disperses and then eventually arrives and settles at a new location. Um, so this is showing a track of a, a wood stork initially tagged in South Carolina and it started its migration about November 4th. And then um, eventually it looks like it completed its migration around November 8th. And this is shown using uh, net square displacement, like I mentioned before. So it's the distance from where it's originally tagged, where it's showing zero, 
And then once we see this kind of hidden asymptote where it's staying steady is it's essentially its final destination here. And then another purpose could be for data cleaning. Um, so you may have a tag that was transported or sent from the manufacturer from Germany or from New Zealand. And maybe the manufacturer turned the tag on and did some tests with it beforehand and then sent it to you. And then you turn the tag on just to check to make sure everything worked. And then you went out into the field and tagged your animal of interest. Um, well, you have all these new points at the very beginning of your track that you may be interested in removing before beginning your analysis. Um, so this might be a, an exploratory way to kind of visualize where those points could be. And then you could see here on um, this time series plot for this Y coordinates um, where this changes and then eventually reaches uh, this steady state um, for a tagged green sea turtle. So you're not going to find a green sea turtle in the middle of Houston. Um, this animal was tagged along the coast of Texas and then it was released. Um, so these just are a number of examples of how this app might be useful if you have animal movement data. But if you wanna explore multiple individuals at once, this could also be done in this second tab I have up here at the top. Um, so the first one I was just showing is the explore data tab. Um, the second one is view all tracks and that allows you to look at all individuals of your data set at once. Um, so there's a drop down menu on the sidebar panel and you can select any or all individuals as part of your data frame and then um, filter these based on the date and time that they were tagged and these will be updated on this map. Um, so currently this only is accepting linear time. Um, I don't have anything yet for using day of year or anything like that, um, although that would be useful. Um, but this is just at least another way where you can visualize all individuals on the same map at once and look for patterns potentially of uh, co-occurrence through space and time. All right, so preparing to move on to the live hands-on demonstration. Um, I'm gonna first just give a brief refresher, like I mentioned before, of just how Shiny works, what it is, and some basic uh, concepts and topics that I'll be using, and then we'll actually get into to coding. Um, so just to describe how Shiny operates. Um, so essentially you have your app and this is your user interface. This is the front end of your app. And you have inputs, which is what the user is potentially changing or adding to it. And then outputs, which are all the things you're visualizing. And these could be plots or tables or text that's outputted. Um, it could be any number of things. So whenever the user sets an input, um, this goes from the user interface to the back end, which is the server, which does data wrangling or performs calculations or updates other objects. And then once this is done, this returns the output back to the user interface. And this is what the user will visualize. Um, so in a nutshell, I think this is a pretty good graphic of just how Shiny is supposed to work. Um, but I also wanna discuss reactivity. So reactivity and reactive expressions cache values and only change when an object becomes invalidated or when your input is changed. Um, so reactivity is really useful in Shiny in general, I think, um, because it makes things uh, much cleaner, increases efficiency, reduces redundancy, um, and kind of improves the uh, user experience, I think, um, overall, and then helps your, your app respond more efficiently. So uh, reactivity is essentially a kind of like a lazy way to only update objects um, when a user has changed the input value of something. Um, so to kind of help demonstrate what this would be, um, here's one diagram showing inputs on the left as this one shape. In the middle are your reactive expressions and on the right are your outputs. Um, the color is meaning that the, for green, that the object's ready or it's already stored a value. Uh, anything in gray means that it's invalidated or it's out of date and needs to be updated. And yellow means that's what's currently being executed at the moment. Um, so in this case, uh, this first output at the top is ready to be executed. And therefore these inputs, the first two, and then the first two reactive expressions need to be updated and stored in order to create this output. Um, and these reactive expressions could be a drop down menu, like I showed before, for selecting an ID. It could be selecting a region of interest based on different um, regions or plots that you were studying for a forest or something else to that effect. Um, so, reactive expressions could be a bunch of different things, um, but they're just something that you want to update and have um, change 
kind of instantly. Um, and then for this diagram, what would happen next after this output is created and changed green when it's completed, um, these other gray outputs would essentially require the other input and reactive expressions to be updated so that everything is completed and rendered. And once that's done, presumably your user is going to change an input somewhere to see what happens for one reason or another. Um, so once the input is invalidated, everything else downstream of that from reactive expressions to output will also become invalidated. So change gray, and then we'll need to be updated um, until everything is green again. Um, so in a nutshell, that's how reactivity works. Okay, so to get started, um, I have a link here for this GitHub repo to access the code that I'm gonna go to. And I show here all the different packages that I'll be using for this bare bones app that I'll demonstrate with. These first set of packages are all available on CRAN. Um, and in case people run into issues, if you're trying to follow along and use the code while I'm presenting this, um, I show the versions of each of these packages that I'm using in case there's some issue. Um, and the only package that's not on CRAN is this last one, nest R, and that's available if you run this commented out piece of code um, through GitHub. Um, so if you want, you can do that right now, um, but I'm briefly just gonna discuss each of these packages and why I'm using them before going on to uh, GitHub and accessing the code. Uh, so the first one, Shiny, is to use Shiny to create your app. Uh, the second one, Digraphs, is for creating our time series plot that I showed before. The XTS package is for handling and wrangling time series data, and that's going to be used to feed into Digraphs. Uh, the Leaflet package is used for our interactive mapping. Tidyverse essentially comprises a number of different packages. Um, but the ones I'm going to be primarily using for this are dplyr uh, for data wrangling and the per package for more data wrangling with lists. Uh, Lubridate is going to be used for handling uh, date time objects or classes. And library SF is going to be um, for handling spatial data. And the last one, nest R off GitHub, is going to be used for um, accessing our data set we're going to be playing with today. All right, so I'm going to get out of this presentation and go to this um, link. So I'll see if I can just throw this in the chat if it lets me, I can't find, well, let's see, chat. I just put it in the chat, Josh. Good. The okay. link to the GitHub repo. Yeah. Yep, it's in there. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so I'm going to go to my browser and just enter that in. So if you follow that link, you should see the GitHub repository uh, for the Shiny webinar series. And there will be one folder labeled Cullen Viz Space and Time. So if you click on that, inside of there will be the PDF of the slides that I'm presenting on today. So if you want to refer to that later, those will be stored there. Um, but if you go to app.r, that is the file that's going to contain this bare bones app we're going to use. Um, so the top kind of bar of this, this app.r file, you'll see two buttons, raw and blame. Um, if you click on raw, if you are following along, and you're going to do this in R, R Studio as I do it, um, you can do control or command A, and that'll select everything, and then just copy and if you open up a new session for R, R Studio, um, we'll plot that or um, paste that there. So I'm going to create a new script, either Command or Control Shift N, or just come up here and create a new script and paste it in. Um, and I'm going to change my working directory to my downloads but set your working directory wherever you would like. Okay. So at first I'm just going to save this app now as app.r like it was in the GitHub repo. And then I'm gonna run it and click this run app button just to show how it works again. And because this is a bare bones app, all the aesthetics and user interface are basically cleaned out so this is just the essentials here, focusing mainly on 
the stuff going on in the server. Um, but we still have this sidebar panel with our two inputs for ID and variable, our time series plot um, here is showing date and then our map at the bottom. So if I was to change this to the X coordinate, I can then follow along this X coordinate time series, click and drag, we'll update the time series here. And then that reactively updates the extent of this map and the portion that's highlighted. Um, so that's just basically showing how it works. Um, but before I get into different pieces for Shiny, I'm first going to start off by just showing what's going on with this time series plot and how to make one outside of Shiny. And same with the leaflet map, um, just to kind of demystify that. And then we'll pull it all back together and see how it works in Shiny itself for this application. Um, so if you ran that, you would have this wood storks object in your environment locally. If not, then just run data wood storks. Um, and I have all this data at the very front of this, this file, this R file. Um, and this is outside of the user interface and the server. Um, so to improve app performance in general, you want to have um, your data outside of there, um, out of the user interface or the server. So the first bit of data wrangling I'm going to do is just creating a new um, variable, a new column called NSD. So what that's doing here is taking the wood storks data um, to run the app, the ID column needs to be labeled ID and then the coordinates need to be labeled X and Y and then date needs to be labeled date. Um, so date is already labeled properly, um, but I need to change the column names for ID, X and Y from what the original names were. So I use rename from dplyr um, and then I split this by ID into a list. Um, and that's because the, the initial starting location is gonna vary by individual bird um, from these, this wood stork data. And then I'm using the map function from per to um, basically define the X naught and Y naught coordinates, the starting locations. And then using that to calculate net displacement here. And then you just square net displacement to get net square displacement, which is labeled NSD. So this returns that list. And then I use the bind rows function here at the very end from dplyr um, to make this back into a data frame. So that's what we have in our environment is now we have this fifth variable, same number of rows. Um, and I just changed this here from woodstorks2 to data to make it more general as it's working in the app. But um, for now, I'm just gonna leave that out. But if I go to, let's see, line 95 through line 102. I'm just gonna copy and paste that into a new script and show how digraph is working on its own. So this digraph function and this set of lines of code um, are basically taking this reactive object dat filt and dat filt is just the the reactive object of a single individual. So when you select an ID from the drop-down menu, it creates this object. So to just make it comparable to that, I'm going to create an object called dat filt from woodstorks2, and using that pipe operator from dplyr, I'm going to filter that ID by the first unique ID in this data frame. So then now it's from 9,488 observations to 5,401. Okay, so now I need to update some of this code just a little bit. So reactive objects often have these open parentheses after them in Shiny. Since we're not in Shiny, I'm removing that. And I'm also gonna remove everything in these square brackets. So this is the variable that we're gonna be selecting that we wanna visualize. So in this example, I'll just select the X coordinates. Again, here I'm gonna remove these open parentheses since we're outside of Shiny. And then these other two lines, I wanna change the name of the label for the Y axis and then for the legend. And that should be it. So if I run this chunk of code in my viewer here, we now have our time series plot. So this is the X coordinate being shown on the Y axis over time. Um, so this is what it would look like in the app essentially. And again, you can still click and drag and then if you hover over any point of this time series, 
at the top here, the legend shows the date and the time. And then for this variable X, the X coordinate, it shows that value, which is negative 80.85. So this is in latitude and longitude. Um, and then if you want, you can slide around with this uh, range selector and either drag it or move the handles to change that window of time you're interested in. If you want to zoom back out to the original extent of that time series, you can either double click. If it's up, yeah, there we go. Or you can also click this reset zoom button. And that's a little more intuitive for people that don't know to double click um, to zoom back out. Um, but to walk through what's happening here with how you create this time series that I'm showing, um, if you only run this first line of code just in that digraph function, it creates just a basic version of this time series plot. Um, so these are all default values for aesthetics, for labels and everything else. Um, so the colors, this kind of teal color, uh, we have these grid lines on the plot. There's no axis labels. Um, for the legend up here, um, this variable is labeled B1 for variable one. Um, so to improve some of these, I have these other lines of code. So the die series function is including um, labels and things for the legend that's shown at the top and for the stroke width or the thickness of this time series line. Um, so now we see that it's labeled X here in the legend instead of V1 and this line's a little thicker. This line underneath that is adjusting the axis, the axis labels. So now we see for the Y axis, we have X for X coordinates. Um, and some of these are a little bit larger um, in their size, but we still don't have this range selector at the bottom shown originally. So if we include this next line, die range selector, that includes this which you may or may not want to include. It's entirely up to you. Um, I think it helps show the full time series if you're zoomed in. Um, so you wouldn't really know that otherwise if you're in this plot, especially without this reset zoom button. Um, and then a lot of the other things are just aesthetics. So the die options is more the uh, panel background of this plot. The die legend is more the, the width here that I'm adjusting for the legend. Die on zoom adds that reset zoom button in the top left. And then the die crosshair adds that vertical line um, to show where you kind of are hovering over. So if I run all that again, we remove those grid lines. Um, and then we have this vertical bar that we can kind of trace and follow along our time series. So essentially, those are all the components that are, are making up this time series plot and how it just works on its own outside of Shiny. Um, and then for looking at creating a leaflet map, I'm going to go back to the app.r code and scroll down to lines 137 through 149. And this is just going to create a very basic version of our leaflet ma map. Um, I'm going to copy and paste that into our uh, unsaved script here that I did for the digraph uh, plot and then walk through some of this code. So this is creating an object labeled datfilt.sf. Um, so it's using functions from the SF package for handling spatial data. So I'm going to remove these open parentheses again, because this is outside of Shiny. It's not reactive. Um, so we have this datfilt object we've already defined. Um, and we're using this ST as SF call to make an SF object. We have to say which uh, variables or which columns are our coordinates. And we have to define our coordinate reference system or CRS. Um, and this is in latitude and longitude, so it's unprojected in WGS84 geographic coordinate system, and that number is 4326. If you had a projected coordinate system, if you're in UTM or uh, um, some other coordinate system, you can change this value. And then after that, I'm piping this function stcast to make it a line string. So if I didn't do that, it would just give us a plot of points um, by default. So by making a line string, I'm turning it into a continuous track. So I'm going to run that. And if I just print that to the console, we see this output. So it's calling it a line string. It's a simple features object. Um, dimensions are in X, Y. It tells us the bounding box values. They're the extent, our CRS, and then just kind of prints the, the top 10 rows here of this object. 
And then for actual making the, the map in Leaflet, the first line we're defining our data that we're reading into Leaflet. We have our add provider tiles function. And here I'm selecting the Esri world imagery or satellite imagery. Um, that's gonna be our base map. And then add poly lines is gonna add our track, basically our continuous track. And I'm defining longitude and latitude here um, based on these ST coordinate functions um, from our SF object dat filled.sf and using as numeric wrapped around those just because if I don't, um, sometimes it throws me a, an error or warning in shiny. And then you could define some aesthetics like the weight or thickness of the line, the color, opacity, things like that. And then lastly, I'm adding this widget for a scale bar. So if I run all of that code here in our viewer tab, um, we get this, this track. So it's a basic map. Uh, we have our scale bar at the top right. I can zoom in, pan around. Um, and again, all we're plotting here is just this gray line, this gray track, um, just kind of our, our base underlying track without any um, time segment or track segments being highlighted at the moment. Um, to go to the other part of the um, leaflet code, I'm going to copy and paste lines 163 through 201. So I'm gonna add that back to our other unsaved script and just build upon this map a little bit further. So uh, we have these three different small chunks of code. The first one, the object DFSF is defining um, our highlighted track segment of interest. So this would be uh, reactive based on that time series plot in our time window. Um, for purposes here, I'm just gonna assume that it's the entire extent or the entire range of the track. So I'm just gonna set it to that DAT filth object we've already defined to keep this simple. And I'm going to do the same for these next two chunks of code. And these are defining the start point and the end point of the track um, using the dplyr slice. So I'm gonna run each of these chunks of code. And then for this section here, uh, you have to use leaflet proxy for updating maps in Shiny beyond the base map. Um, but all I want to really want to add on um, for now is this fit bounds function. So I'm going to copy and paste this back to our code up here. So fit bounds is defining the boundary box or the extent of uh, the map that you're seeing initially. And then I'm also going to copy and paste um, the second function here for add poly lines where the color is dark turquoise all the way through each of the add circle markers functions and copy those and paste them um, at the end of this first chunk of leaflet code. So our first add poly lines is defining this, this underlying gray track so that's what we're going to use to just show the full extent of the track, regardless of the time window that's highlighted. Um, the second one that's in turquoise is going to define what we are interested in, at least at that point in time. So again, it's only defining uh, longitude and latitude based on that DF SF object that's going to be impacted and affected by the digraph plot. And then our add circle markers are making these points for the very start and the very end of that highlighted track. So if I was to run this, hopefully everything yep, worked. Um, you should get this plot where you have the entire highlighted track on top of the gray track. And now we have a red dot here. And we don't see the green dot because it's underneath the red one. So if I zoom in, we see how close these two points are, even though they're separated by months um, over the course of a, a full year during this migratory period. Um, and they're only a few kilometers apart. Um, so this, this individual is essentially returning to the exact same location that it started. Uh, that's about the extent of detail I'm gonna go into for making maps in Leaflet. If you're interested in more detail and adding other features in Leaflet, um, definitely attend Thomas Connor's talk uh, September 14th, and he'll be discussing how to make maps and other, adding other features in Leaflet specifically for Shiny. Okay, so that's essentially how you would make the leaflet map as well as the time series plot outside of Shiny.
Um, but now going back to our shiny script, just a simple R script. Um, I have all the, the packages loaded at the very beginning here. And then, like I mentioned before, the data outside of both the user interface and the server. I define the server starting around line 52. And like I mentioned before, since this is a bare bones app, I'm just keeping this all very simple. Um, only the minimal that needs to be there. If you want to add further aesthetics, you can do so. Um, but for now, this is just going to stay pretty simple. So this could be, I'm using fluid page to define the layout of the shiny app. You could use fluid row, nav bar page, any number of different things, depending on how you want it to be set up. Um, and then within that, I want it to be a sidebar layout. So I want the sidebar panel to have all of our inputs and then the main panel to have our outputs, our, our time series plot in the map. So for sidebar panel, I'm defining two inputs. These are our drop down menus. So I have one that's labeled animal ID and another that's labeled var. And then I have the, the text that goes along with them. So for animal ID, you select the animal ID you want to explore. The choices I'm setting are all the unique IDs as part of this data sets. And the one that's selected by default is the first unique ID. For the second drop down menu, uh, selecting a variable, the choices are all columns besides ID since that's separate. Um, and the one that's selected by default is the first column that's not ID. So that's everything that you would need to create these inputs and that sidebar panel. For the main panel, uh, we only have two things here at the moment. So it's just the digraph output. And this is our uh, time series plot labeled line plot and then leaflet output, which is our map, our leaflet map. And I'm just simply labeling this map. Um, so at a minimum, this is all you would need uh, for your user interface. But the server, which I define starting line 77 is where basically all the magic is happening. Um, that's where we're defining how all these things are working together. Um, so for any typical server, how you define that, this would be a function call with an input, output, and session arguments. Um, I do a little bit of housekeeping here with modifying the data. Um, I typically like to keep the ID as a character class as opposed to a um, factor or numeric or something else, because it'll, it'll widely vary based on what data set you're using. Um, so this tries to keep it at least a little more consistent, I think. And then I ensure here with this second line, um, with this as date time function from Lubridate to make sure that this is a date time class, not just a character class. Um, and that makes it usable for these other functions that analyze this time series. Uh, for lines 84 through 88, this is our first reactive function for this app. Um, so our reactive expression here, we have these parentheses and then curly brackets inside of that making this dat felt object that I mentioned before. Um, so the only thing that's essentially happening here for this reactive expression is I'm filtering um, this data set by the animal ID that was selected in that dropdown menu. So there's only two individuals for this data set. Um, so depending on which one you choose, that's what's going to be defined here as this object D. And eventually that becomes this reactive expression, reactive object dat filt. And that's what we're going to use further on for our time series plot. Uh, like I showed before, here's all of our functions for making that digraph time series plot that use dat filt. But now you would need to use these open parentheses. Um, if you don't use open parentheses for a reactive object, you're going to get errors everywhere. Um, so anytime you use a reactive object, make sure that you have open parentheses. And this is all wrapped inside of a render digraph expression. So this is what you would need to use um, if you're making a plot with digraph um, within your server section of your code. And this is being assigned to the output for a line plot. And like I showed back up at the top for the user interface, uh, too far, um, the digraph output here, I've already named it line plot. So you need to use that exact name um, just after the dollar sign here without the quotes. Um, but I'm not going to discuss the digraph code further since we've already walked through that a bit, other than just that we also have here this input dollar sign var, and that's our variable that we selected in that other drop down menu. And that's what's going to be used for labeling the axis and the legend. Um, and that's what this XTS 
function is going to use to make a uh, time series variable. But the primary section of code, so where all the uh, linking between space and time is happening, is this large chunk here. So essentially between lines 113 through 130. Um, so this is how we're going to connect what you do in that time series digraph plot to your leaflet map. And what I'm doing is creating a another reactive object called dat filled time, basically meaning that we're taking the dat filled object and we're filtering it by time. Um, but instead of just a reactive expression here, I'm using event reactive. And the reason behind that is that I only want um, reactive to listen or essentially wait to change an update based on um, two different inputs here that could change. Uh, the first being dat filt, so that reactive expression um, that we just created when you choose a new ID, and then input uh, dollar sign line plot date window. So this is going to be the start and end date times based on the, the time window you click and drag uh, from the digraph plot, is that's how you would refer to it. Um, and I wrap this all in a list, and that way it acknowledges each of these. Um, so event reactive is going to be watching or listening for both of these two objects or inputs to change before it does the rest of the remaining code. Um, and typically for a reactive object or an observe object or expression, you will include this rec function and that's going to require whatever is wrapped inside of there um, for some of the remaining lines of code. Oftentimes, if you don't include that, that might throw you a warning or an error. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do within this reactive expression is um, define a start and end time and make these as date time objects. So I'm taking the first uh, time from that time window of that time series plot and using the strip time function to create this, this object start. And I'm using the TZ function from our original data set data um, if we already have a time zone defined. And then doing the same for end with our second value for time from digraph to create the end object. And with those two, we have this if else expression. <clears throat> so we're saying that if that start object is equal to the minimum date from our dat filled object, our dat filled uh, reactive object, and if end is equal to the maximum date from dat filled, that we want the entire object dat filled back. Um, that means we haven't done any filtering at all. It's, it's just the entire object uh, for that one individual. If there's any filtering that happens, so else, uh, we create this new object subset, and that's what we're going to do some filtering on um, inclusively for start and end. And that's going to return this, and you'll refer to it um, in further lines of code as dat filled time with open parentheses. And lastly, I pipe in this one last piece of code, um, dbounce, and that's a function from the Shiny package. And that's actually introducing a delay or a lag in this app. And that seems counterintuitive. Why would you want to slow your app down? Most of the time, you want to speed things up because um, users hate having to wait for things to load and change. Um, but I'll give a demonstration as to why you might want to include this. So within the current version of the Bayes Move package on CRAN or GitHub, um, I don't have that line of code in there. So hopefully I'll update that soon. Um, but for now, I'll give a demonstration with this wood storks data and show why this, this line of code is important. So here's the version from the Bayes move package. And let's say I want to focus on that square displacement and maybe select this one window of time when they're in the Everglades. And this will update here on this map. So it, it's, it works pretty well if I'm only doing things around this time series plot. But if I start moving around the range selector, that's when things start to kind of freak out a bit. So if I just make a bunch of different changes to this and dragging and sliding, it just gets hung up and delayed. It's making every little change based on what I did. It doesn't wait for me to finish moving that slider around. Um, so you could wait here potentially for five minutes for this thing to, to update and finish before you can continue and see what you actually selected. Um, it's just going to keep blinking and changing. So instead of waiting for this, I'll just close out of that app. 
Um, but essentially that's why I'm introducing this debounce function is it prevents that from happening. Um, so I'm setting this to 500 milliseconds. Um, you can make it to wherever you want, but I, I felt that this um, time duration has helped a bit. All right, so that's that's the main key feature of this code, linking that uh, time series plot from Digraph to the map that we've tested out already with Leaflet. So now we have our outputs, dollar sign map. So map we labeled before in our user interface function or uh, object. And then uh, our render Leaflet expression is wrapping the, the plot we already made before. So I'll kind of pass over this. Um, but the next piece is important that I didn't discuss already. So now we have this observe expression. And before I talked about reactive objects and how those work and reactivity in general, um, observe objects and expressions are really similar, um, except that while reactive objects tend to be more lazy, they only uh, cache values and then update when needed, when things become invalidated. Um, observe expressions are more eager. Um, so they want to change more frequently, although they don't create new values that you store in an object, um, they just cause new changes to happen. Um, so I have another rec function here to require this dat fill time reactive object that we just created based on the, the time series plot with that new window. And I have to define this new <clears throat> um, full length of the track again, because we're going to wipe that out each time as I'll show beneath um, in some lines of code. But then here we already uh, showed these in the, the previous example outside of Shiny where we have our highlighted track segment DFSF and then the start point and end points for that highlighted track segment. Um, and again, for dat fill time and the Shiny app, you wanna include those open parentheses since it's a reactive object. But returning back to the leaflet proxy function, um, this is what you would do if you want to basically use a reactive map. Um, so leaflet by itself, as I showed before, is better for just making a static, not a static, a, a base map that you don't really want to continue to update. So you don't add new things to it. Otherwise that can really bog your app down if it's needing to update the underlying satellite imagery or other um, points and layers every time. Um, that, that could just slow things down a bit. So anything that doesn't need to be continuously updated, you leave separately um, in that leaflet call. Otherwise, you use leaflet proxy and everything here is going to be updated um, whenever you drag around that, that time window slider. So some of the first things I need to do are clearing the shapes and clearing markers. So this is why I'm creating that underlying full length of track again in gray. Um, even though I made it in the original base map. And that's because I'm gonna clear all tracks regardless of what was there before. Um, so I, I need to draw it again, but if you don't clear your tracks or points, you, every time you change that time window or individual, um, it's just gonna keep them there and they're gonna start overlaying on top of each other and you don't really be able to see that well. Um, so we have to clear them each time we make updates. Again, like I mentioned before, the fit bounds is defining our boundary box or our extent of our map. Um, and I find this to be a really useful feature. So if you select a time window that's quite small and your animals migrating across like a continent, um, instead of having to zoom in and pan around every single time to get that track to fit within your viewer panel, um, it's nice to just have it reactively update for you. It's a lot more convenient. Um, and then again, beneath these are the underlying full length of the track shown in gray. And then our highlighted segment of track based on that time window from digraph and our start and end points as these add circle marker, add circle marker calls. Um, and that's the end of the server. Otherwise you just have this line of code at the end, shiny app where you define your user interface and server. If you have a single app like this, and then you can just run it. Um, but to show potential extensions of what else you could do with this, uh, what if you wanted to add a table to this app as well? So I showed before you have this time series plot and you have a map, but what if you're interested in another variable as part of your data set and you wanna see how that relates to what you filtered by um, from that time series plot? So what you could do pretty simply is go back to the user interface. And if I 
add a comma after that leaflet output in the main, main panel. I'm going to do data table output and label this new thing tab for table. And if I scroll all the way down to the end of the server, just above that curly bracket, I'm going to define a new output called tab, which I just made, and then use the render data table function or expression, and um, then add dat fill time. Add those open parentheses, and this should just add uh, a table essentially. Save that um, right under the map. And it's only going to show values in a table for all the data that's highlighted as part of that track that we selected. Um, so if I go back to, let's say, net square displacements, and I'm going to focus on maybe the very beginning before the, the bird initially migrates. So update. Yep, there we go. So we have this coastal region in South Carolina. And here is our table. So we have five columns, the ID, date, X and Y coordinates, and that's square displacement. And you can um, sort these based on each of these different columns. You can change the number of entries that you're seeing. You can search. Um, and then if there's a bunch of observations, you can go through different pages um, based on using data table here for, for Shiny. Um, there's only 424 observations here. The original data frame with both individual with this one individual is 5,400. Um, and then you can potentially add in additional widgets for exporting just that data, if that's what you're interested in, um, or things like that. So that's a relatively easy extension you could potentially add in for an app like this if, if you wanted to. Okay, so if I go back to my presentation, related R packages. So the ones I primarily focused on here outside of just using Shiny were Digraph um, for making that time series plot and then Leaflet for making the map. Um, but I've included some other um, R packages that I would recommend as things you can explore as well. Uh, so for time series, I think High Charter makes pretty decent maps and that interfaces with that JavaScript uh, library. Um, and Plotly, I think more people are familiar with, but it also makes nice interactive uh, time series plots. Uh, for mapping, map view, I would say is really similar to Leaflet, and that I think provides you with a lot more control in general. Um, but then the remaining packages, you can also use High Charter and Plotly for mapping as well. Um, and then TMAP for making inter -map, interactive maps. Um, I just think these are a little more limited in what you can do with them um, compared to packages like Leaflet or Matthew. And then potential other uses for your Shiny apps. So like I, I demonstrated, you potentially add a table um, and you might want to filter that based on what your selected or filtered variable of interest is for that period of time. Um, you may also create multiple other tabs that are conditional upon the time series you've selected from that digraph plot. Um, or you might want to export data based on what you've selected. So thing, objects such as shape files or rasters, or if you just download it as a CSV file or some other format, um, that could also be of use. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending and listening to me today. Um, I've included my contact info here, as well as links for a vignette from the Bayes Move app that I have online to the package website um, that provides a walkthrough of just how to use it. Um, as well as the link for the, the Shiny server application version of, of this app. Um, so with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. That, that was great. So um, I just to, uh, to mention, I think jo uh, Jody put here in the chat that um, we are going to make the recording of this seminar um, all, uh, available online, uh, and, and she posted the, the website here. But also, for those of you who have um, specific questions or you want to troubleshoot something, um, a couple of us are going to stay longer, and we might be able to help you, uh, both Josh, Lindsay, or myself, I might have to leave soon. Um, 
but but again the the code of what josh presented is available on github uh on the fe um account so i posted the link again um and so hopefully you found this useful and um just before we open up for a question i just want to mention that again this is the first of a series of webinars and um uh, i hope you found it interesting and uh i hope you can join us on on the following on the webinars there to come thank you so josh i think right now um there is one question on uh the paul eve.com okay um we can maybe we can start there and then if people have additional questions, they can raise their hands. There are not that many people now at this moment. So the, the question uh, on the website is if there's a way to edit the data while interacting with graphics, like the example that you find the tracking data in Germany, can you flag remove that in the data in Shiny? Um, so at the moment, I, I don't have that incorporated in this app. Um, but I have seen at least for other, either our packages that were used in apps or other ways where you could potentially do that. Um, but what I kind of mentioned at the end, I think is if you were interested in exporting the data back into your, your working directory, you can just filter it and then add an export widget <clears throat> and that'll export the shape file or the CSV file or whatever it is, um, based on what time series you've highlighted from that line plot. So it is possible, um, at least similar to what I've done, but about like pointing and clicking on different points in that map. Um, I just at least don't have any functionality for that as of now. And there's another question that was uh, posted here. If you could say something about why you chose uh, Digraph as opposed to High Charter or Plotly. Yeah, so I, played with both Plotly and High Charter first, actually. Um, and Plotly worked well, I think, for interactive figures or plots in general. Um, but it just, it didn't display time series the way that I kind of wanted it to be shown. And I, I forget exactly what some of the issues I had with High Charter were. Um, it might have just even been just getting things to work properly without causing warnings or issue errors. Um, I think at least at one point I got part of it to work. I just couldn't necessarily, um, customize all the things I wanted maybe. Um, so then I turned to Digraph and I think Digraph is also the only one that had that, um, smaller plot underneath it where you can look at the full extent of the time series and play with that range selector. Um, and that's not available in, in high charter plotly if that's something that's important to you. Um, but I got digraphs to work and it allowed me to do all the different uh, aesthetic changes I wanted. So I thought that was useful and stuck with that one. Thank you again for, for participating. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, on the next uh, seminar.